I'll try that again. Good morning. There we go. Now we're live. That little word, that was to make sure you're all awake before we get started. So hopefully you're hopefully you're to that point. My name is Jim. I'm one of the pastors here at Summit View Community Church. It's an honor to to be with you this morning, an honor to open the word of God with you this morning. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2 this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I, I apologize, um, I do have notes available. I forgot to get those out uh, to the greeters to be able to hand out to you. So if you are a note taker and want some of those, there's you can find notes on the, the Bible table stands there. Uh, so feel free to grab some of those if you're interested. So on first Sundays of the month, sometimes we will... Uh, take a break from the series that we're in. We're going through First John right now, uh, but today we are making use of that opportunity, taking a break from that in Second Timothy, and we're going to be talking about uh, being soldiers of Christ and having the fortitude of a soldier. Having the fortitude of a soldier from Second Timothy chapter two, and the main idea this morning is this: that as suitable soldiers for Christ, we are called to strength, we are called to discipleship, and we are called to service. We are called to strength, discipleship, and service. Before we look into God's word, let's go to him in prayer. Father, we are blessed together here as your family to worship you, to lift your name high. Lord, I pray as we enter into this time of worship in the word, that your word and your spirit would do the work that only you can do in each of our hearts and lives. Lord, that we would be drawn to you in a greater way. Lord, that we would have a greater appreciation for who you are and what you are doing, and a greater understanding for the plans and purposes that you have for us in your kingdom as soldiers in your army. Lord, I pray that each of us would be changed today because you have met with us. Lord, we commit this time to you. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Audie Murphy was an unlikely hero. He was weighing in at only 112 pounds, and with the face of a child, Audie was 18 years old when he went overseas during World War II. Nothing about him suggested a hero in the making. Yet when he was called upon for, by his commanding officer to do the duty of a soldier, he held nothing back. By war's end, this quiet boy from Texas had fought with extraordinary bravery and he'd saved the lives of countless fellow soldiers. He returned home to an adoring public, and he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, and he received at least 36 other medals, more than anyone else in U.S. history at that time and even now. Why? All because nothing meant more to him as a soldier than the will of his commanding officer. Nothing meant more to him than the will of his commanding officer. And that's really a theme for us today as we look into this passage of being soldiers for Christ, that nothing is to be more to us than the will of our commanding officer, Jesus Christ. So let's look in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. 
So that's the passage we'll be walking through. Let's go back to verse one and begin to break down this passage together. He says, you therefore. Now, whenever we run into a therefore, what are we supposed to do? Look and see what the therefore is there for, right? In other words, we need to back up. There, it's, it's a loaded statement here in verse one when he says, you therefore, my son. He says, you need to remember everything that I've said that's of importance, which every verse is of importance, right? But let's highlight the, the highlights or the, the main things that he's recalling to Timothy's mind from chapter one. As he talks to him about being strong in the Lord, back up in chapter one <clears throat> and look in verse six, Paul says this, for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh. That means fan the flame, fan the flame, the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. This is an appeal by Paul to Timothy to continually and vigorously use the gifts that God has given him. Fan the flame, Timothy. God has given you spiritual gifts. You need to be using them, and you need to be using them well, and you need to be using them strategically in the church, in the body of Christ. He says in verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power of love and discipline. Timothy, don't tiptoe around with those gifts. Don't tiptoe around the ministry that God has given you. He has given you a spirit and a, of power and love and discipline. That word power there in verse 7 is the word we get dynamite from. Paul is telling Timothy, you have dynamite power living inside of you as believers, as those who have trusted in Christ as our Savior. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We have the Spirit of God living inside of us. That is amazing. That is phenomenal. That is dynamite power is what Paul is saying. That's explosive power. That's amazing power. That's mountain moving power. He says, that is within you. Stop shying around. power, love, and discipline. Therefore, he says in verse 8, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. So in ministry, don't be ashamed of your fellow believers. Don't be ashamed of the Lord. Speak of him wherever you go, whoever you're talking to. In verse 13 of chapter 1, he says, Retain, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me. In verse 14, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure that has been entrusted to you. So it's these truths that Paul is calling upon as he talks now here in verse 1 of chapter 2. Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I want us to see this morning as we walk through this passage five principles of being a good soldier, five principles on being a good soldier. And the first one is this, our source of strength is from Christ. Our source of strength is from Christ. He says in verse one, you therefore be strong. And there's not a period right after that. If that's all he said, Timothy, be strong, then we could maybe expect, he means you yourself be strong. But how many times do we live as believers as if there's a period right after that? In other words, how many times do we live and walk and serve in our own strength? I'll be the first to admit, I fall prey to that far too easy. We live in this country of a pull yourselves up by the bootstrap mentality. Audie Murphy, as I mentioned to you this morning, strong grit pulling himself by the bootstraps, walking in strength. But as believers in the army of God, as soldiers in Christ's army, we dare not walk in our own strength. We must walk in the strength of the Lord. He says, walk in the strength of the Lord and the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus is our source of strength. 
Ephesians 6.10 tells us that we are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not our might. One of my favorite verses in scripture is 2 Peter chapter 1 and, and verse 3. It says, seeing that in his divine power, he has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him. What has he given us? Everything. He has equipped us with everything we need for our lives and for our lives of godliness, for our lives of ministry, for our lives of service as soldiers in his army. He is our equipper. And he is the one who gives us strength. Turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. In the first part of chapter 15, Jesus talks about this tree and vine or uh, branches and trunks and twigs, imagery, if you will. And he talks about how we are the branches and he is the tree. He is the trunk. I remember um, as a, a young man, uh, one of the, oftentimes my dad would bring us about every year, every other year out here to Colorado on vacation. And we were camping uh, just outside of Estes Park at a campground there. And they advertised uh, ice cream social and concert free. Well, we're all about free. So we went. Ice cream was awesome. And the concert was actually a, a believer. The man presented the gospel, sang Christian songs, songs that he wrote himself. And I, to this day, can still remember a song that he sang that came from this passage. But you got to be little so God can be big. Though he is the trunk, you're just a twig. So get down, ego. Your trip's all through. Heavy on you, Lord. It's all on you. If we cut a branch off of the tree and leave it on the ground, it's going to die. It's not able to, to do anything in and of itself. It has to be connected. That source of life and strength is from the Lord. So look in verse 5 of John 15. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And he emphasizes that word, nothing. You can do nothing apart from him. You say, well, I, I, I don't know about that, Jim. I, mean, I do a lot. I mean, my, my days are full. I'm busy. I get a lot done. Is it your plans or his? Is it of eternal significance or not? Now, it can be doing the same thing every day, but actually it can either be done to his glory or not to his glory. It can be done according to his plans and purposes and ways or not but we're not going to accomplish his plans and purposes apart from him. He tells us we can do nothing apart from him. He must be our strength as we serve as soldiers for Christ. A soldier's lifestyle demands strength to endure. <clears throat> God gives us the needed power freely. I remember as a young man, oftentimes we would quote Philippians 4.13, just kind of flippantly, right? without even looking at the context. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, often while I was lifting weights, right? <laughs> but if you look at the context of that, he's talking about going through hard times and suffering and difficulties. That's the context. Look with me at verse 2. Flipping back to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and, and verse 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What is it that Timothy has heard from Paul? Well, namely the scriptures. 
and the application of the scriptures and the implications of the scriptures and wisely applying scriptures to life and ministry. That's what Paul is saying here. You take all of that, those teachings, the word, the ways of God, <clears throat> the things you've heard from me, and you entrust these to faithful men. This is really cool. You see a fourfold here, progression of ministry. Where does it start? Well, actually, you could say five. It started with God, right? He gave his word. That was given to Paul. Paul then gives it to Timothy. Timothy is now to entrust it to faithful men. And then they will in turn entrust it to other faithful men. Do you see the discipleship pattern here? Do you see what church life is about? Please pray for us as, as your shepherds, as we are talking about praying through and strategically planning, what does discipleship look like for us in 2023? And that's part of it, isn't it? Right here, this is what God tells us through Paul to Timothy and for us. It's entrustment. Entrustment is to place into another's possession or trust, to make a deposit, to commit something to safekeeping. What Paul really specifically is talking about here in discipleship and entrustment is, is concerning the church and the body. And that's just one part of making disciples, isn't it? And we'll go to that passage. In fact, you can turn that now if you want, but Matthew chapter 28. But here he's speaking specifically of equipping and teaching and training believers to be able to equip and train other believers. But at the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18. <clears throat> and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. Okay, so he just laid the foundation. I, Jesus, have all authority. So listen to what I'm about to say. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, <clears throat> the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Excuse me, there's several commands there, but actually the main verb, the main command verb there is in verse 19 in the make disciples. Go is a participle, it's a, a lesser, but it still is a command to go. But the main one is to make disciples of all nations and baptizing them. When he uses the word make disciples, that word means make apprentices. Make apprentices. And you do that by going to all the nations and baptizing them. That leads us to believe that you're sharing the gospel. They come to know Christ, and now you're baptizing them. So part of this discipleship, part of this making apprentices is going to the lost and talking to them, actually, and sharing the good news, sharing with them simply what God has done in your life and what God has done for them and inviting them to be a part of that and to become an apprentice, and to become an equipper. For far too long has the, the church in the USA <clears throat> just kind of said, you know what, I don't really have to go and talk to others. I mean, that's what the pastor does, right? I, I just invite people to come to church, and he throws the big net, and he gathers the fish. No. No. No, we're, we're all a part of that. Now, some of us are gifted in that more than others, right? There's the gift of evangelism. Some of us, God gives us a tremendous gift. And I would say to them, you need to hear what Paul is saying to Timothy. Use that gift. Others have giftings in other areas, but we use our gifts. And when God gives us opportunity, we tell them. But you don't leave it to the pastors. You don't just say, oh, I'll bring them in and let them do it. Actually, when you look at Scripture, 
The shepherds are the one to be equipping everyone else in the work of the ministry. Not that they don't do it as well, but we're equipping everyone. This is a, this is a um, whole army effort using the gifts that God has given us to reach out in various ways. So he says to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them here, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's the side of discipleship that's now equipping. So there's the, the witnessing, the, the sharing the good news of the gospel, and then teaching them to observe. That's the equipping, equipping believers. So the second principle for us on being a good soldier is we are to be involved in discipleship. We are to be involved in discipleship. You never know how the Lord will use one life. A Mr. Kimball has started with a Sunday school teacher, Mr. Kimball, in 1858. He led a Boston shoe clerk to give his life to Christ. That shoe clerk was Dwight L. Moody, who became an evangelist. In England in 1879, he awakened evangelistic zeal in the heart of Frederick B. Meyer, <clears throat> pastor of a small church. F.B. Meyer, preaching to an American college campus, brought to Christ a student named J. Wilbur Chapman. Chapman was engaged in YMCA work, and he employed a former baseball player named Billy Sunday to do evangelistic work. Billy Sunday held a revival in Charlotte, North Carolina, North Carolina. And a group of local businessmen were so enthusiastic afterward, they planned another meeting, another evangelistic campaign, and they brought in Mordecai Ham to town to preach. During Ham's revival service, a young man named Billy Graham heard the gospel and yielded his life to Christ. You could be one of the tens of thousands who have heard the gospel and come to know Christ through the proclamation of the word through Billy Graham. Only eternity will reveal the tremendous impact of the one who invested his life in the lives of others. Are you sharing? Are you discipling? Where does this start? In the home. Parents, mothers, fathers, and especially fathers you have a tremendous opportunity. You are the discipler of your home. Men, we're to be discipling our wives. We're to be discipling our children. We get to do that. We must do that. We would be abhorred if we enlisted men to be in the army, they signed up. We issued them their boots and their uniform and handed them a gun and said, go get them, boys. Would you not scratch your head? Would you not say what? No boot camp, no training, no strategy, no instruction, no equipping. Our families, men, desperately need equipping for this world we're living in. We as the church body desperately need to be equipped. We need to be equipping one another. We need to be discipling one another. We need to be coming alongside one another. We are not called to be Christian Rambos in this world. I know it looks cool on screen, but that's not God's economy. Look with me in verse 3. <clears throat> In verse 3, he says, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And let me just back up. I'm reminded here as I read verse 3. Paul gives us in the first three verses, he gives us three commands. The first one in verse 1 is be strong. It's not a suggestion. He says you need to be strong, but remember that's in the Lord. The second one in verse 2 is entrust. It's not a suggestion. He's saying you 
need to be about the work of entrustment, of equipping, of serving, of using your gifts that God has given you. And then thirdly, in verse three, when he says, suffer hardship, that's the third command. Suffer hardship. How many of you are ready to sign up for that? We'll have a sign-up sheet coming around. Suffer hardship. That's what Paul is saying. And oftentimes we leave that part out, don't we, when we tell others, come to Christ. Put your faith in him. He's going to solve all your problems. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Is that true? He does have a wonderful plan for your life. And part of that includes suffering. We will become disenfranchised with the Lord if we think he is to protect us from suffering, from all suffering. God the Father had his one and only son suffer. Tremendously on our behalf. Who are we to think that he won't ask the same of us? Who are we to say, Lord, you can have my life, you can save me, forgive me my sins, provide a, a home for me in eternity, but I'm not signing up for suffering. Then I don't know if you really know Christ. Do you love him? Paul says, suffer hardship. Again, notice there's not a period after that. He doesn't say just suffer hardship. Well, most of us could just go out and bring hardship on ourselves. But he says, suffer hardship, number one, with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. This is really the theme of the book of 2 Timothy. Suffering hardship with others. We're in this together. That means we're serving together. If Timothy is suffering with Paul, that means they're serving in the same way, in the same manner. They're locking arms as soldiers for Christ. And then notice it's as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. It's not suffering for suffering's sake. It's suffering for the cause of Christ, for the name of Christ, for the purposes and the plans and the agenda of Christ. Here's the third principle for us. We are to endure affliction. We are to endure affliction and take and take our mission seriously. This endure affliction means to endure or suffer, suffer evil together. It's unity in the body of Christ. It's, it's not individuality. Again, it's suffering for the cause of Christ as a soldier for Christ. Not suffering as a soldier in the U.S. Army, albeit that is an important thing. And if God calls you to that, then suffer in that role as well as in the role of suffering for the cause of Christ. It's not suffering for just moral principles or moral programs or causes. It's suffering in the army of Christ. Rogers and Rogers wrote this. As what Paul was writing about, let me back up. Paul is writing here about soldiers. And you have to put yourself in the place of the hearers of that day. Were there soldiers commonly seen? Absolutely. Maybe even more commonly than it is for us. I mean, sometimes we see soldiers in business places. Sometimes we see them driving in their Humvees down the highway, transporting equipment. Maybe we see him on the news, but for them, this was a common sight to see the Roman soldier decked out in his uniform, his armor. The Roman soldiers had a presence, not just physically. And so when Paul writes about this, this is what is being brought to their minds. And let me read to you what Rogers and Rogers says about the Roman soldier. He says this, quote, always ready to faithfully obey his commander without grumbling or complaining, constantly in training whatever hardships must be endured, fighting bravely, never leaving his post, even if it meant death, 
working with his company as a unit, carrying out a specific task, was the one who received the praise from his commander and was rewarded for his service. This was a good Roman soldier. Okay, so that's the backdrop now for what Paul is saying, suffer with me as a soldier for Christ. I want to read through that description again, inserting questions of application for us. So he said, always ready to faithfully obey his commander without grumbling and complaining. Am I this way with Christ? Constantly in training, whatever hardships must be endured, do I train this hard as a believer? Fighting bravely, never leaving his post, even if it meant death. How many times do I leave the post when it becomes inconvenient, let alone deadly? Working with his company as a unit. Am I serving with my fellow believers as a team? Think about that description for a moment. How am I, how are we doing as spiritual soldiers for Christ? Well, we've seen the first three principles coming from those first three commands in the first three verses. Paul now kind of transitions in verses four, five, and six, and he now illustrates for us what a good soldier looks like, again, using some images of other people that would be readily conjured up in their minds. Look in verse four. He says, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. The soldier in active service does not entangle himself in the affairs of everyday life. And he says, so that, or for the purpose of, here is the reason so that I may please, so that you may please, so that we may please the one who enlisted him so that we may please our commanding officer, Jesus Christ. Here's the fourth principle, or part of it anyway. We are to have the focus of a soldier. We're to have the focus of a soldier. We don't get caught up or involved in the cares and the enticements of the world. We should stay focused on the mission that God has given us. Now, maybe already in your mind, you have coming up, well, what does that mean? I mean, am I to sell everything? Am I to quit my job? Am I to go pray 24-7? How do I do this? Does this mean I, I literally do nothing else? Well, yes and no. <laughs> How's that for a non-committal answer? No, it doesn't mean that you quit your job and do only that. But yes, it does mean that you do everything. Oh, there's a verse that actually says that. Everything you do, you do for the glory of God, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do. So you can be working your job and be on mission for God. In fact, did you know working a job, providing for your family is actually a spiritual service of worship? If you're doing it for the Lord, remember that tomorrow morning. <laughs> Monday's coming, right? I have to go back to work. How you get to provide for your family and serve the Lord on mission wherever he has planted you in that place of employment. So it means that we are still at work. We're still living in this world, but whatever you're engaged in, you're using on mission with the Lord. You're you're demonstrating the Lord in and through your life wherever you are, but you're on mission. You're focused like a soldier. Shortly after joining the Navy, there was this new recruit who went to his officer and asked if he could have a pass uh, for the, the rest of the day because he was, in, um, he was in a wedding. So he went and asked the, the officer, and the officer granted him the pass, handed it to him, and he said, soldier, you need to be back by 7 p.m. today. He says, sir, I, I, don't, I don't think you understand. He's like, I'm in the wedding. 
I'm the best man. And he said, no, soldier, you don't understand. You're in the Navy. Sometimes we walk in that misunderstanding of this young soldier. Lord, I'll serve you, but I, but I, Lord, I'll do that, but. Whose are you? Scripture says we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. I so appreciate this quote. Short and simple and sweet. The Christian life is not a playground, but a battleground. The Christian life is not a playground. It is a battleground. Do not allow yourself to merely play the soldier's role, but engage yourself in active duty for the Lord. Remember, the Christian soldier has only one goal and purpose, and that is to please his enlisting officer, Jesus Christ. In verse 5, he gives another picture or illustration for us. He says, also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. So he showed us the focus of a soldier in verse four. Here in verse five, he tells us the discipline of an an athlete. He shows us we need to have the discipline of an athlete. You must compete by the rules to win. You must compete by the principles of God, which are found in his word. Don't take shortcuts in the Christian life. Our life must be concentrated upon Christ. Just as a professional athlete, his life is concentrated upon his chosen contest. The spare time Christian is a contradiction in terms. The spare time Christian is a contradiction in terms. Lord, I'll give you my time when I have time. That's a contradiction of what Christianity is like. How many of you enjoy watching the Olympics? My family and I like when we can to catch and watch some of the Olympics. It's amazing to see these people and the feats that they can accomplish. And it's interesting to, to sometimes when they do those specials and hone in on somebody's life and you see the training that they go through, the work and the effort and the sacrifice, and not just the sacrifice of that athlete, but man, the, the tremendous sacrifice of really their whole family, of what it takes to help equip them to get to be where they need to be. And they do all that for what? They do that for four years or maybe eight years for the hope of maybe getting a gold medal or a silver medal or a bronze medal. How many of you can remember 50 years ago who won the whatever? Any, any competition 50 years ago in the Olympics. Maybe some of us. How many of you remember the person who shared with you the gospel and shared with you the hope of Christ? How many of you remembered someone who took them, took you under their wing and said, let me show you how to walk with God? Let me show you how to know Christ. Let me show you how to serve in Sunday school. Let me show you how to minister to men. Let me teach you and equip you. You don't forget them, do you? And neither does God. God sees, God knows, and he's pleased with the work and the sacrifice that is done for him and his name and his strength and power. There must be discipline in the Christian life. There are times when the easy way is very attractive. There are times when the right thing is the hard thing, and there are times when we are tempted to relax and to relax our standards. How about me? How about you? Am I disciplined in meeting with God? Studying his word, knowing his principles running for him. (laughs) 
Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, therefore, and don't worry, we won't go back and look at what the therefore is there for here. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance. That means to put off, cast away, get rid of every encumbrance that sin which so easily entangles us. It surrounds us, impedes us as the verbiage here. And let us run continuously as that word run, always with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. The word fixing is in the present tense. It means you keep your eyes locked on him. Keep them fixed on him. Because you cannot serve as a soldier in his army without having your eyes fixed on him. You won't make it. You won't last. fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author, the founder, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider, he's imploring us, he's commanding us, consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The Olympians, they know this. They throw aside everything that hinders them. Anything that is extra, that is not absolutely necessary, they get rid of. He's calling us as believers to do the same. What do you have that's impeding you? What is holding you back? What is keeping you from running the way that God is calling you to? Jesus says, cut it off. If the eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to stumble, you cut it off. If this causes you to stumble, what do we do? We put it back in our pocket. If it causes you to stumble, get a dumb phone because that's the smartest thing you can do. We need to deal decisively. Jesus is saying, Paul is imploring decisively with what is holding us back. Back in 2 Timothy. Second Timothy 2 and verse 6, he gives us a third illustration. He says, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. We've seen the focus of a soldier, the discipline of a, an athlete, and now we see the work ethic of a farmer. The work ethic of a farmer. This verse emphasizes the words here, hardworking working. We're to make this a continuous process or habit in our life. He compares the Christian life to that of farming. And when we look at these illustrations, when we think of soldiers, we think of an army. It's easy to think of a team. When we think of athletes, they're oftentimes on a team. But it's interesting in this illustration, a farmer is a lot of times by himself. A lot of times he's out there putting in the long hours and the difficult work and the drudgery early in the morning or late into the wee hours. Does it mean he really is truly alone in the battle? No, but he, he is serving sometimes by himself, and that will be true for us as well. We're not alone. Look around this room. You are not alone. You have brothers and sisters serving alongside you, and you have the Holy Spirit living in you, but there are going to be times when you might be by yourself. You keep working hard. I like how the, the illustration continues. 
farmer has to till the ground. He, he's sowing the seed. He's watering. And that's what God has called us to do in the lives of others. As farmers, we're tilling the ground, the soil in someone's life. That first conversation may just be prepping their heart to hear more of God's truths. That next conversation, and maybe it's still a part of the same first conversation, but next you're, you're planting the seed, and then later you're watering. And then hopefully, just like the farmer, at the right time, there's a harvest. But does that farmer make the crop grow? Does he make the corn come up out of the ground? No, there, he can't. He, all he can do is till and plant and water, and he has to leave the rest in the hands of the Lord. And it's the same for us. You can't make someone come to Christ. But you can till the ground. You can plant the seed of the word. You can water it with the word. But it's the Lord who brings the harvest. No one comes to him apart through Christ. It's the Lord who draws people to himself. But we get to be a part of that process. And he says, you work hard at it for my glory. We see the fifth principle for us in verse 7. In verse 7, he says, consider, and here he gives us another command. The word consider, and it's in a continuous sense. You need to think upon, you need to meditate upon this. Think, calculate, come with understanding. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. The fifth principle for us is this, the Lord will give us wisdom. He will give us wisdom as we reflect upon the scriptures. As you think over it, as you meditate, as you chew on, work out what the Lord is getting at. I had a mentor of mine who, instead of the, using the word meditate, he would use the word medicate. And I kind of like that imagery or symbolism it is using that word meditate, but it's, it's medication for us, isn't it? Medicate on the word. Let God and his word and his spirit do the work in your life. As you give it time, as you give it consideration, as you sit before the Lord at his feet. And say, Lord, teach me. Teach me what this means. Teach me on how you would appropriate how I should appropriate this in my life. Turn with me to Psalm 63. And as you're turning there, think about, we won't go to it, but Psalm 1, I think we're all familiar with it and the imagery that, that the psalmist gives in Psalm 1, that when we delight in the word of God, we'll be like a tree firmly planted, unmovable, fruitful growing. If we look in Psalm 63, starting in verse 1. This was written by David, and it was written by David when he was in the wilderness. So just keep that in mind. He's not sitting in the air-conditioned AC uh, of the castle. He doesn't have the fans being waved at him. He's out in the wilderness. So Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, he's in the wilderness. If it was me, I would probably be saying, Lord, where's my water? Lord, I need a, a streams of living water, physical water right now. I'm going to die. I'm parched. But no, he says, Lord, I thirst for you. I'm seeking you. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better, is better than life. My lips will praise you, so will I bless you. As long as I live, I will lift up my hands 
in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises and joyful lips. David thinks more of his God than of physical water while he's in the wilderness. He's seeking, hear this, in verse 1 and 2, he is seeking the blesser more than the blessing. Shame on me for seeking his hand when I should be seeking his face. As a soldier of Christ, I need to be seeking Jesus, not what he can give me. He's already promised he will give everything that we need. I just need to worry about seeking him. Does that describe us? The Holy Spirit, he says, will teach us and enlighten us. He will give us understanding in all things. As we seek him, as we seek his face, as we meet him in his word. This is one way he supplies his soldiers for battle, supplies their needs. Again, from 2 Peter 1, 3, how he provides what is needed for life and godliness. We faithfully meet with him. In conclusion, I want to quote a pastor of old, Richard Baxter. Listen to what he says. It's a most lamentable thing to see how most people spend their time and their energies for trifle, for trifles while God is cast aside. He who is all seems to them as nothing, and that which is nothing seems to them as good as all. Let me say that again. He who is all seems to them as nothing, and that which is nothing seems to them as good as all. He goes on and says, It is lamentable indeed, knowing that God has set mankind in such a race, where heaven or hell is the certain end, that they should sit down and loiter, or they should run after childish toys of the world, forgetting the prize that they should run for. Were it but possible for one of us to see this busyness as the all-seeing God does and see what most men and women in the world are interested in and what they are doing every day, it would be the saddest sight imaginable. Oh, how we should marvel at the madness and lament the delusion if God had never told them what they were sent into the world to do or what was before them in another world, then there would have been some excuse but it is his sealed word. He has given it and they profess to believe it. As suitable soldiers for Christ, we are called to strength and discipleship and service. To wrap this up, what what do we do with this? How do we apply this? I've given you five applications for us to think through. Number one, rely on God's strength. Rely on God's strength to live as a suitable soldier and not your own. In other words, cultivate, and this will help in that this will produce that cultivated dependence upon God. Cultivate a dependence upon God. When you have that sudden twinge in you that goes, I don't know what to do, or I'm not doing this well, where do you go? Right then, right there, you go to God. And maybe even before you start it, you go to him. Maybe we should start there. Cultivate a dependence upon God. Secondly, let nothing mean more to you. Let nothing mean more to you than the will of your commanding officer, Jesus Christ. Humble yourself before God. Humble yourself before God. Even our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, prayed this way in the garden. 
Lord, not my will, but yours. Thirdly, be faithful in hard work. Dis excuse me, be faithful in hard work, discipline and endurance in your labors for the Lord. Remember, there is a reward here on earth, but even more so in heaven. Fourthly, be faithful. Be faithful to meet with Jesus and to study and meditate with him upon his word. This will give you wisdom and strength and discernment and peace and perspective and direction. I know we didn't go over verse 8, but verse 8 is now being brought into this as we wrap things up. It's the, the fifth application. And it is remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. Look at verse 8 in 2 Timothy 2, or listen as I read. And I want to read it as Paul wrote it to Timothy and how it was intended to be taken Remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. It was meant as a battle cry. It is a unification of us as soldiers. Remember our commanding officer. Remember what he did for you. Remember he died for you. Remember he has risen. He is a living savior and he is all powerful. Remember Jesus Christ. you go to the Lord with me in prayer. Father, you are good. You are creator. You are sustainer. You are all powerful. You are God of the universe. Lord, you have made a way of forgiveness and salvation. You've made a way of, of relationship with you. Lord, thank you that we can know you. That you've given us your word. You've given us your spirit. Lord, who are we? You're mindful that we are but dust. Lord, you, you want us to be involved in what you are doing. And you call us and you equip us. And you love us. You forgive us. Lord, it's an honor for men and women to serve in the national military, but Lord, what a tremendous honor and blessing and privilege to be a part of the army of the Lord God Almighty. Thank you that you gave your life for us so that we might have life, and life eternal and life with you. Lord, help us to be faithful soldiers in your army. Lord, may we keep our eyes fixed upon you. Lord, may we be diligent in our training. Most of all, may we be diligent in knowing and seeking you. Guide us individually, guide us as families and as a church body, Lord, as we seek to walk faithfully with you, as we seek to to serve strategically in ways that you would have us to serve and to minister and to disciple. 
one another's and those who are yet to be a part of your kingdom. We pray this for your honor and glory, for your kingdom plans, your plans that cannot be thwarted. In just a moment, you'll have an opportunity to to pray, uh, maybe some more just yourself, to, to pray with those around you, to pray with your family. I encourage you to to talk to the Lord, maybe you, more about what he may be speaking to you about, ways that you could appropriate some of the truths that his spirit was speaking to you about today. But we also have the privilege this morning to, to come together and, and to remember as we've been talking about today, remember what the Lord has done for us. We, we have an opportunity in just a moment, we'll, we'll take communion together. Uh, this is available to, to all that are here, but we encourage only if you know the Lord is your Savior. If you, don't, if you haven't trusted in Christ as your Savior, then, then this remembrance really is, is not for you. It, it doesn't mean anything to you. But for those who know Christ as Savior, whether you're a regular attender or a member or not, if you're here today and you know Christ as Savior, we invite you to, to partake in this. If you're new and uh, not familiar with the process, we will, in just a moment, you're able to come up as an individual or a representative of your family and take the elements back to those in the, the chairs. And you can take those together in your own time and in your own way. But the Lord has given us this opportunity, this tool of remembrance of what he's done for us. It, it doesn't gain us any merit. It doesn't gain us any special favor. It's a way of remembering what he has done and celebrating his resurrection. We proclaim his coming until he does come as we partake in, in this time together. I want to read in preparation from Hebrews 10 and verse 10 and following. By this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until he his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. We we'll take some time together to, to pray with those around you and, um, and then you can come in our time together, the, the cracker and the juice. Thank you. 